Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. Dr. Lillis is an associate professor and the academic dean of St. John's Seminary in Camarillo, California, as well as the academic advisor for the St. Juan Diego House of Priestly Formation, or the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Through the years, clergy, seminarians, religious, and lay faithful have benefited from his lectures and retreat conferences on the Carmelite Doctors of the Church and the writings of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. He's the author of Hidden Mountain, the Secret Garden, a theological contemplation of prayer, as well as numerous other books focused on the spiritual life. In this series of conversations, we discuss the letters of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Thank you once again for joining me, Anthony. Oh, it's wonderful to be with you, Chris. I'm, I love this series and, and marching through these letters with you. They're beautiful letters, and I love the conversations that you evoke. This particular letter, I think, is very special in that in some of the previous letters, we have heard her talking with friends and acquaintances of, and maybe extended family members. But this letter is addressed to one who is very near and dear to Elizabeth's heart. That's right. This letter is written to her sister. Also, in this part of our program, moving forward, the letters that we're doing are, are letters that are written as she draws closer to her death. This is written sometime in April of 1906. Elizabeth had heard a few months before in prayer that she was going to die. And sure enough, soon after she heard that in prayer, she was diagnosed with Addison's disease or adrenal gland deficiency. This is a disease that affects the adrenal gland. It doesn't, the gland doesn't work like it's supposed to. And so it prevents the body from metabolizing food. And without proper metabolism, your whole body begins to, to fall apart. In fact, what happens, your body begins to swell. You look kind of bloated and overweight and you get very, very weak. It becomes harder and harder for her to walk. And so in April of 1906, she probably looked like, and everybody believed, in fact, that she was at the very end of her life. Her desire was, was to die on Good Friday, to have a death that was in perfect imitation with Christ liturgically. But in fact, what happens is she, on Good Friday, receives the anointing of the sick, and when she does, she's healed. And so they're singing the Salve, and even as they're singing the Salve, she's, she's starting to get better so that she's able to join them at the Easter Vigil, one of the first liturgies she was able to join the community with for some time. And so this letter is written around this time. She, In her heart, there will be a little bit of disappointment, but also a realization that God has his own plan and she needs to learn to accept that plan and not live in kind of a romantic world. And at the same time, she, she's acknowledging that the Lord has led her even deeper into the mystery of his faithful love. And it's a good thing that she lived too, because all of her most important works from this point forward are written during this time period. The only exception would be her prayer to the Holy Trinity, oh my God, Trinity, whom I adore. That was written a couple years before this, but all of her major writings, all of her most important works are written at this time of her life. And so the letters that we choose from here to the end are all letters from, from this very important time. Something that we've seen in lives of the saints, haven't we, Anthony, that desire to have that and I'm not trying to mock it, but that dramatic death, though it's, I'm sure, a holy, pious intention of heart to want to die on Good Friday in imitation of Christ, it, it is something that many saints have hoped for, and yet it just didn't work out that way. That's right. Now, 
to set it in context, Elizabeth is puzzled by this, but it wasn't like she was depressed by it or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I think she was kind of glad to have some more days of life. (laughs) Good. That's wonderful. uh, Good. And, you know, and to be sure, she's not completely out of the woods. It wasn't uh, the kind of healing where, where she was completely restored between now and July. She'll remain more or less bedridden. But she is able to to write a little bit more. And certainly by the time this letter, I think, is written in her own hand. Uh, some of the other letters from this time period are dictated. But this letter, she herself writes. So it gives you a sense of somebody who uh, will see in the words of the letter. You know, she doesn't believe she has long to live, but she's grateful for the time she has. Around the end of April 1906. Having loved those who were his own in the world, he loved them to the end. Darling little sister, I don't know if the hour has come to pass from this world to my father, for I am much better, and the little saint of Bona seems to want to cure me. But you see, at times it seems to me that the divine eagle wants to swoop down on his little prey and carry her off to where he is, into dazzling light. You have always put your Sabeth's happiness before your own, and I am sure that if I fly away, you will rejoice over my first meeting with divine beauty. When the veil is lifted, how happy I will be to disappear into the secret of his face. And that is where I will spend my eternity, in the bosom of the Trinity that was already my dwelling place here below. Just think, my Geet, to contemplate in his light the splendors of the divine being, to search into all the depths of his mystery, to become one with him whom we love, to sing unceasingly of his glory and his love, to be like him because we see him as he is. Little sister, I would be happy to go up above to be your angel. How jealous I would be for the beauty of your soul that I have loved so much already here on earth. I leave you my devotion for the three, to love. Live within, with them, in the heaven of your soul. The Father will overshadow you, placing something like a cloud between you and the things of this earth to keep you all His. He will communicate His power to you so you can love Him with a love as strong as death. The Word will imprint in your soul, as in a crystal, the image of His own beauty so you may be pure with his purity, luminous with his light. The Holy Spirit will transform you into a mysterious lyre, which in silence, beneath his divine touch, will produce a magnificent canticle to love. Then you will be the praise of his glory I dreamed of being on earth. You will take my place. I will be Laudem Gloriae before the throne of the Lamb, and you, Laudem Gloriae in the center of your soul. We will always be united, little sister. Always believe in love. If you have to suffer, think that you are even more loved 
and always sing in thanksgiving. He is so jealous for the beauty of your soul. That is all he has in view. Teach the little ones to live in the sight of the master. I would love for Sabeth to have my devotion to the three. I will be at their first communions. I will help you prepare them. Pray for me. I have offended my master more than you think. But above all, thank him. Say a Gloria every day. Forgive me for having often given you a bad example. Adieu, little sister. How I love you. Perhaps I will go soon to be lost in the furnace of love. Whether in heaven or on earth, we must live in love to glorify love. It's a very rich passage. If you just look at all the different ways she refers to God, he's the divine eagle who's swooping down upon her. He is the divine beauty who fascinates her. His face is veiled, but as this veil is lifted, as she passes from this life to the next, she can see the secret of his face. She speaks of the bosom of the Trinity uh, as her dwelling place. She speaks about the light of the splendors of his divine being, searching the depths of his mystery. This language, she doesn't view God as static, let alone as boring, but her vision of God is one of a fascinating, inexhaustible mystery that is capable of thrilling us, exhilarating us to the deepest core of who we are. God then can satisfy all the desires of our heart, And not only that, not only does he disclose himself, allow himself to be unveiled in this way, but he's also actively coming for us. He's a divine eagle ready to swoop us up. And all we need to do is surrender ourselves to him. So this is the vision she gives us of the Holy Trinity. It is amazing the fact that in her suffering, she's able to reflect in that and to to be able to articulate it at such a young age. I mean, so often, I know from my own experience, we go through suffering and we fall into the trap of the why me or where is God and why doesn't he love us? And yet here's Elizabeth who is able to encounter in such an incredible way an in understanding of his presence. Is this something that we all can experience or is it just for those chosen few? No, I think this is something that the Lord gives us all a foretaste of, and we're more or less conscious of it in this life. And so in heaven, this will be for all of us, the fullness of it will be ours. Uh, In this life, we, we can have little tastes of it, sometimes longer and sometimes more characteristic of our hearts. The more we're surrendered to him, the more he's able to give us. The reason why so many people don't experience the Trinity in this way is because they don't take time to enter into the silence that allows the Lord to unveil himself to to them. They don't let themselves be completely surrendered to him. And instead, they let themselves get taken up by worldly anxieties and concerns. Oftentimes, there's a lot of good reasons for those concerns. I'm, I'm not trying to make light of them. But because they are taken up, because there's not a deeper level of trust and surrender to God, because we've allowed ourselves to be distracted, the Lord can't disclose himself to us in a way that that allows us always to appreciate what Elizabeth is saying here. You know, she's basically presenting the Trinity as our home. It's a place where we belong. And oftentimes we don't experience the, the Trinity as a warm, 
comforting home, the, she says, the bosom of the Trinity. We don't experience that for ourselves as the place where we belong, this comforting place, because our hearts are so preoccupied with other busy affairs. Because of her suffering, because of the gift of prayer, she's been brought into a place where she sees this more poignantly than we often do. And it's a good reminder for us, still our hearts, discipline our lives, enter into silence every day, pray, because what God wants to give us can really satisfy our hearts. What he wants to give us can meet our deepest needs. What he wants to give us is truly comforting and refreshing and strengthening. What he wants to give us is fascinating. It sets our whole being on fire so that we can finally live life to the full. He wants to give all of that. But for us to receive it, we need to kind of look at the way we're living and ask ourselves, are we availing ourselves of this mystery? Or have we let ourselves get preoccupied with a lot of worldly anxieties that at the end of the day don't quite mean very much at all? We'll return to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis in just a moment. This is Chris McGregor of Discerning Hearts, a nonprofit Catholic apostolate dedicated to evangelization and spiritual formation through the use of new media. Discerning Hearts creates engaging multimedia specializing in audio and video productions which are faithful to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and its rich, authentic spiritual tradition. Its mission responds to the Church's call to use the media for evangelization, catechesis, and spiritual renewal. We have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truth shared through Discerning Hearts totally free to users throughout the world. Besides our website, DiscerningHearts.com, Discerning Hearts has a newly updated free app where users can find all their favorite Discerning Hearts programming, including Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more. There, too, you'll find numerous beautifully produced devotionals and novenas, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, to help users create a sacred time for prayer wherever they may be. Discerning Hearts programming can be found on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. Discerning Hearts also has an ever-growing YouTube channel. Discerning Hearts online spiritual retreats and seminars have helped souls in North and South America, Europe, Africa, Australia, the Middle East, and the Philippines. For many people all around the world, Discerning Hearts is a daily source of inspiration, spiritual nourishment, and encouragement. We can only do this thanks to the generous financial support of our friends and benefactors. Please consider donating to our mission today. The world is looking for answers, for spiritual guidance and authentic discernment, for relationship and community. Your support is very much needed and appreciated. Please keep our mission in your prayers and tell a friend about Discerning Hearts. We now return to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. What else can we glean from this letter, Anthony? So who's this little Saint uh, Bon uh, who seems to want to cure? She's speaking about a venerable Margaret of the Blessed Sacrament, a Carmelite whose beatification was being worked on at the time. Uh, All of the Carmels around France were cultivating a devotion to this uh, Saint Margaret who lived in the 17th century was influential on for the growth of Carmel in France. And so the community obviously has been asking this to our Blessed Margaret at the time. She's St. Margaret now. Pray for Elizabeth of the Trinity for a healing. But do you notice, and this is what I wanted to point out, Elizabeth has an interesting notion of the communion of saints. Like saints can pray for things and ask God for things, and sometimes they prevail upon them. But God also has his plan too. And in this case, God wants to take Elizabeth up into glory, and and at the time, Venerable Margaret is kind of praying to keep Elizabeth on earth. So anyway, it's just kind kind of a fun thing, like the conversations that happen in heaven have an impact on 
the way we live our lives down here. We oftentimes don't take them very seriously. But Elizabeth, at this stage of the game, she's trying to figure out, now, who was it who, <laughs> whose intercession uh, prevented me from going to the Holy Trinity? It was this, ah, you know. <laughs> a venerable and, prompter. She was yeah. trumped by a venerable. And she does bring up the angelic realm as well. So Elizabeth has this concept that when she dies, she's going to be able to help people here below. And in particular, she will have a protective mission of her sister. This is part, also part of the Catholic doctrine of the communion of saints. Death is not more powerful than our love for one another. Death doesn't get the final word. And so those who go before us in the faith, they continue to love us and they continue to bless us with their prayers and their presence in our lives. Um, uh, but always this prayer and presence is in the order of grace and, and by faith. A saint who stands before the throne of God is able to ask God for good things for the, the people they love. And, and Elizabeth is seeing that she will have this precise role for her sister. Little sister, I would be happy to go up above to be your angel. How jealous I would be for the beauty of your soul that I have loved so much already here on earth. I leave you my devotion for the three, to love. Live within, with them, in the heaven of your soul. The Father will overshadow you, placing something like a cloud between you and the things of this earth to keep you all his. He will communicate his power to you so you can love him with a love as strong as death. The word will imprint in your soul, as in a crystal, the image of his own beauty, so you may be pure with his purity, luminous with his light. The Holy Spirit will transform you into a mysterious lyre, which in silence Beneath his divine touch will produce a magnificent canticle to love. Then you will be the praise of his glory I dreamed of being on earth. You will take my place. I will be Laudem Gloriae before the throne of the Lamb, and you, Laudem Gloriae in the center of your soul. We will always be united, little sister. Always believe in love. The, this passage is a powerful one about the Holy Trinity. And what she's doing is she's appropriating to each of the persons certain graces, uh, images, that kind of help you understand what the indwelling of the Trinity is. The Father is the one who overshadows, who places a cloud between you and the things of the world. Anyone who's taken their faith very seriously knows what this cloud is. Sometimes the cloud is uh, you experience some frustration because you think you want something and God just doesn't seem to give it to you. And other times you experience this cloud as a blessing, like you realize that there were things that they were close to you. If you were too close to them, they would destroy you. You just can't control yourself. The Father loves you, and he protects you from those things. If you let him, he can protect you from those things that will destroy you. And sometimes he protects you from things that you think you really, really want, and he knows that they won't be good for your spiritual life. And so he overshadows you so that your devotion to the Lord can become strong. And in this overshadowing, he communicates power to your soul. And this power is a power that allows you to love him. I think today, sometimes in our marriages and in our families, we feel so powerless sometimes. And in our powerlessness, we kind of give up. Our faith asks us to do something different. When we feel powerless, our faith asks us to turn to the Holy Trinity 
and allow the Father to communicate his power to us. And where and when does he communicate his power to us? He communicates his power to us when we draw into the silence of prayer, even just for a few minutes. The Father can communicate power to love with a love, says St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, a love as strong as death. I mean, have you ever heard of a father being unpacked in this way? The father's blessings, on one hand, separate you from things in this world that can be can harm you. And on the other hand, it communicates power to us so that we can love with a love stronger than death. And just like she does that with the father, you know, she does the same thing with the word. What does it mean to say the word dwells within you? The word, the meaning of the father, the one who reveals the father, has imprinted himself in your soul, an image of his own beauty. So the Jesus is the beauty of the Father. He reveals the splendor, the beauty of the Father, and that same beauty has been given to your soul so that your soul becomes beautiful. Your soul becomes something that God wants to contemplate. So you may be pure with his purity, luminous with his light. And then finally, the Holy Spirit will transform you into a liar. Um, which in silence beneath his divine touch will produce a magnificent canticle to love. The soul for Elizabeth of the Trinity, she's getting this from Therese. The soul is a musical reality. It's an instrument which God uses to reveal these beautiful melodies that he, he longs creation to be flooded with. The Holy Spirit is the one who does this great work in, us, in our hearts. The Holy Spirit, in fact, makes our hearts musical with the music of eternity, the music of God, the music that is born of silence. It is also something so poignant when she talks about the unity. She talks about the three, and then yet she brings it back in this letter to a unity of heart with her sister. They will both be the praise of glory, one in heaven, one on earth. I will be Laudem Gloriae before the throne of the Lamb, and you, Laudem Gloriae in the center of your soul. We will always be united, little sister. Always believe in love. If you have to suffer, think that you are even more loved, and always sing in thanksgiving. He is so jealous for the beauty of your soul. That is all he has in view. Teach the little ones to live in the sight of the Master. I would love for Sabeth to have my devotion to the three. I will be at their first communions. I will help you prepare them. Pray for me. I have offended my master more than you think. But above all, thank him. Say a Gloria every day. Forgive me for having often given you a bad example. Adieu, little sister. How I love you. Perhaps I will go soon to be lost in the furnace of love. Whether in heaven or on earth, we must live in love to glorify love. And so the unity that you're speaking of for Elizabeth of the Trinity is primarily a unity of love. I believe in love, live in love to glorify love. The Trinity, the Holy Spirit in particular, the furnace of love. It's this that kind of is the, the great gift of Trinitarian devotion. How different is this from, from a view of the Trinity where it's the Trinity is looked at as this kind of abstract puzzle that you need to solve? This is a mystery, according to Elizabeth, instead that communicates a fullness of love and communion uh, that you can give to your loved ones, that you can form your children in. 
Uh, anyway, it's just a beautiful, powerful uh, way of approaching the Trinity, freeing us from kind of a, a way of understanding our faith that is perhaps a little bit too cerebral. This one is very experiential. Uh, once Carmelite nun said, she's existential. And there's a way in which her devotion to the Trinity is existential. She is aware of the Trinity as a reality that fills our existence with love. Any further thoughts, Anthony? I think, to, by way of conclusion, uh, we're coming into a beautiful stream of letters in part of our program, and we're looking forward to unpacking them. And in particular, I'm, I'm hoping that as we go forward, uh, we might receive or really hear the, those words uh, that Elizabeth wrote to Margaret in this letter, or Geet, she calls her. I leave you my devotion for the three to love. Live within them in the heaven of your soul. I hope that this is, uh, in this part of the program, this becomes something that we receive more and more, a gift that we receive more and more, because if we live in the love of the three, if we live in the love of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, it can totally change and transform our lives. Thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you. It's been a gift to be with you. You've been listening to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. To hear and or to download this episode, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com or download the free Discerning Hearts app located at the iTunes and Google Play app stores. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis.